our next chapter is chapter 14, and the title of which is Setting Environmental Standards. And the first question is, what if it's really hard to calculate the marginal external cost curve? We've seen in a previous chapter that there are techniques to help us do that, such as contingent valuation. But does the marginal external cost curve properly take into account the uh, pollution damages to elderly people or to women, let's say stay-at-home mothers? The reason I'm asking is because one of the ways, I guess somewhat connected to hedonic pricing, that marginal external cost is sometimes calculated is through lost wages. So if a, if a person dies, then the cost of that pollution is the sum of their wa the wages that they would have earned if they were still alive. Well, of course, an elderly person isn't earning wages anymore, usually. Uh, Stay-at-home mothers don't participate in the market, usually, either, so they're not earning market wages. So if you use that kind of technique, then the external cost of damaging the health or ending the life of an elderly person or a stay-at-home mother would be pretty low. So you know, we can try to make cost-benefit analysis better, but another another option which this chapter wants to talk about is what if we were to abandon cost-benefit analysis? So this is the only chapter that talks about that. What would you use instead? The suggestion is to use something called the precautionary principle, which means that we want to be sure that pollution isn't causing very serious problems. Part of the precautionary principle says you should use the safe minimum standard, which means use a standard. And you could use an economic incentive instrument for this, but where you put, let's say, the cap of a cap and trade uh, policy, or or the standard if you use the command and control, is at a safe level where the pollution's not causing any problems. In some sense, it's setting external cost equal to zero, or at least to a very low level. Coupled with this is are two points. First, it can be prudent to act before all the evidence is in. Sometimes polluters say, well, we're not sure how much damage the pollution is causing. Why don't we wait until the science is more sure about things? But you can see when it comes to problems like global warming, if we wait until we're absolutely sure about everything, we'll be waiting for many decades. And so this precautionary principle approach says it's prudent to act before all the evidence is in, as long as you know that there's some damages that are being caused by the pollution. Second is that the burden of proof is on the polluter not on the pollution victims. Now the precautionary principle uh, was actually uh, one of its one of its main proponents was David Pierce who's one of the authors of your book. As you know he's from the UK and the precautionary principle does appear in some European Union pollution policies. Not to the extent that you might think based on this discussion. In other words, it's not really true that the burden of proof is always on the polluter in Europe, or that Europeans are going to use safe minimum standards in all situations. But there is a... it is mentioned in some policies, and there is some attempt to try to get closer to the precautionary principle instead of cost-benefit analysis in some situations in the European Union. Next topic I wanted to cover is Box 14.3, where the book discusses an attempt to quantify the benefits in dollars of pollution regulation. This is pollution regulation in the U.S. 
The first row of this table discusses technology-based standards. So this is a standard of the sort that says all the polluters have to use this particular kind of technology. For example, they all have to use scrubbers on their smokestacks. And the net benefits that these authors calculated in, um, in 1994 million US dollars for technology-based standards was negative 60. The next type of standard is ambient-based standard, which says you can use whatever kind of technology the polluter wants to use, but the ambient air quality, so that's the word ambient, so the ambient air quality has to be a certain level. And these authors calculated that the net benefits of the ambient-based standards in the U.S. was slightly positive. Finally, they looked at benefits-based standards, where a cost-benefit analysis was done. So not only the benefits of pollution control, but also the cost of pollution control were calculated, and a weighing was done of those costs and benefits, so that the amount of pollution control that was forced on the firms by the government was, in some sense, appropriate, according to a cost-benefit analysis. And here the authors calculate that the uh, net benefits were uh, 31 million uh, US dollars. So this shows that pollution control regulations, yes, they may cost jobs, but they also have real economic benefits, which can be estimated, not known for sure, but estimated in terms of literal dollars and cents. And the numbers aren't small. I want to close with reading a discussion that the book has on page 200. Now you know that in most situations I'm pretty happy with the way that the book treats its topics, but uh, not in all. So let me read the expert, uh, excerpt. Frey, 1992, argues that the use of economic incentive instruments, which he calls pricing, may crowd out i.e. cause the substitution of any existing environmental ethic in the sector in which pricing is applied. The end result of the loss of ethical commitment in industry due to the application of pricing policies could lead to an increase in pollution in the targeted sectors and also more generally. So this is an idea, this is an attack on economic incentive instruments and says that once you say we're going to regulate pollution with a tax or with a tradable permit scheme. Then the polluters don't get the feeling anymore that pollution is bad or evil. Rather it's, as I said a little bit earlier, a, just a cost of doing business. And what, what this author Frey says is that this means that they lose an environmental ethic which the polluters used to have. And in fact, that this might have a spillover effect. Not only do the, the, regulate, the polluters in this particular sector lose the environmental ethic, but other polluters in different sectors see that, oh, well, I guess society's okay with me polluting as long as I pay for it, so I'm going to end up polluting more. And therefore, they they lose a prior a, a prior hesitancy that they had to pollute, and and that therefore you should stick with command and control pollution strategies. You shouldn't use these economic incentive instruments anymore. Call me skeptical about this argument. If it were really true that polluters previously had an environmental ethic, then we wouldn't have a pollution problem in the first place. Furthermore, I'm not sure I really care what polluters think. What I care about is what polluters do. And if imposing economic incentive regulation makes them clean up pollution in a way that minimizes abatement cost, then I think that's fine regardless of regardless of uh, w what that does to the way they think or feel about the environment. Furthermore, 
having to buy per, uh, permits in order to pollute or having to pay a pollution tax costs money and firms don't like to pay money so it's not clear to me that the firms see this as being some kind of a signal that they can do as much of this activity as they want it's still a cost in fact now it's a literal bottom blind cost rather than being a, a, a command and control uh, uh, quantitative pollution policy and so actually they might feel it more strongly than they did before. So I'm not a fan of this argument by Frey and just wanted to mention that. And this concludes our discussion of chapter 14.